Father, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is willing to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Title of the message is Draw Near. Draw Near. You know the words to the prayer? Pray it with me. Father, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is willing to obey. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, let's, let's start off with, with this text. We're going to, I want to give you a little background on this text, and then we're going to come back to it uh, by, by, by the end of the message and, and hopefully see something that maybe you didn't see before. Actually, the entire book of Hebrews is, is the best explanation of the Old Testament. What it actually does is it takes everything that we know or understand as Old Testament or temple worship and it relates it to, defines it, explains how Christ and what we have entered into as faith is the same thing as the temple worship of old. Well, not the same thing, it's actually better, but similar. And throughout the book, it uses the analogy of comparing what was the Old Testament approach of the offerings and the sacrifices and the temple and the tabernacle, and then showing in the New Testament how Jesus fulfills all of those things, how he is the high priest, how he is the offering, how he is the blood of the bull and the blood of the lamb, and so forth and so on. And I know we've talked about, about this before, but uh, what, what I want you to kind of uh, Keep in your mind for, for this morning two things. One, this is, this is a picture of what the temple looked like in, in the days of Jesus. There, of course, it's a model, but it, it's a model based on, on history. And I want you to notice that, that in, it's, it's obviously the big structure in the center is the actual temple itself. But I want you to notice that outside or in the front of the actual temple, there's an open court, an, an open area. And in this picture, you don't really see anything in, in, in the open court. But it's in that open court that you would have the brazen altar and the, uh, the laver of water. It's where all of the activity, really, of the, the temple would go on. The, that outer, that court that is right in front of the temple is called uh, the, the holy place or the outer court. The actual temple itself on the inside of the building, which we can't see from the picture, is called the, holies, the Holy of Holies, the uh, uh, Kedesh Kedeshim, Holy of Holies. So you have the holy place, that outside court, and then you have the Holy of Holies, where, of course, you would have all of the furniture and, and inside, of the, uh, inside the, the curtain, the actual Ark of the Covenant. But I want you to notice that there's another court. You can see it off to the top of the picture. There is uh, another court that actually surrounds the entire temple. Uh, it's called the Court of Men. And what you can't really see from this is that even further from that, there is another court or another gathering place that is the Court of the Gentiles and the Court of the Women. And what would happen normally when people would come to Jerusalem for the, for the three holidays that everyone was supposed to go to Jerusalem for, that you would be able to approach the temple based on who you were, how close you could get. If you were a, a, a woman, there was an area that you would have to stay in called the Court of Women. There was an area for the Gentiles, Gentile believers, but Gentiles called the court of the Gentiles. And then as you got closer would be the court of the men, and then even closer would be the place for the Levites, and as you got right into the center of it would be the place for the high priest. And so the closer you got to, to the holy place, to the holy of holies, 
uh, the, the, actually the smaller the crowd, I guess you could say, uh, but, but there was a separation for each one of them. Now, this is a picture of the, uh, actually a diagram of the tabernacle, but it, it's the, the way Israel would camp around the tabernacle. In the story of Exodus, God gives Moses a, a design for a new building, a tent, that God would dwell in. Eventually, it would become the temple, but this was its first incarnation, a tent. And the tent was made very similar to what we saw in the temple. There were different areas, as you went out from the center place called the Holy of Holies, there were different areas for different people. And even here on the, on the, on the diagram, in the center, the, those two center boxes, is the Holy of Holies, the actual tent itself. That's where many of the priests would be, and of course, the high priest. But if you go outside from that, the way people would camp around the tabernacle, all of the Levites, everybody who was part of the priesthood, or actually part of the lineage of the priesthood, they didn't even have to be in the priesthood, but they were part of the lineage of the priesthood, they would be camped all around the tabernacle. And so you see the word Levites in, in the orange there. So, so they camp all, uh, they encircle the actual tabernacle itself. Their job was to take care of the tabernacle. But as you went further out, you then had each one of the camps. And, and you could see they're, they're split up into four different camps in each direction, three camps to each direction. And you see that, that as you go out from the tabernacle, there are different groups, from the high priest to the Levites to the, the, the regular Hebrews, the, the, the people of the nation. And there has been, throughout, throughout our biblical history, this, this sectioning off of, of the people of God with regard to their approach to the house of God. Nobody, nobody who was in any one of the camps, Naphtali, Reuben, Simeon, Gad, any of them, none of those men or women or children would ever make their way into the inside of that tabernacle. That would be a place none of them would be allowed. As a matter of fact, even the Levites, the, the Levites who lived around the things of God, who touched the things of God, I know, amen, who touched the things of God, who touched the things of God every day, who saw the presence of God, they were not allowed into the holy of holies. And, and with each layer, there were requirements put on the people. Have you ever wondered why when you read throughout the Old Testament, or even if you look at the Jewish culture today, those that are, are, are trying to practice the Jewish culture to, their, to the best of their ability, that there are a lot of rules there's a lot of do's and a lot of don'ts. There's a particular way that you dress. There's a particular way that you look. There's a particular way you keep your hair. There's a particular way that you eat. There's a particular way that you talk. You've, I'm sure we've, we've all know, we, we know, or you should know by now, there are 613 different commandments, rules given in the Torah. 613 laws, if you would, on how to approach God. Some of those laws were civil laws on how to deal person to person. Some of them were religious laws or ceremonial laws, how to approach the temple. And some of them were moral laws, just what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, uh, what is of God and what is not of God. But all of these rules and regulations were, were across the board things all the people of Israel adhered to. And it was hard for them. You've got to imagine, they're coming out of, out of Egypt. They have been slaves for uh, at least a generation or more. All they know is slavery. All they know is Egypt. And now they are taken out into this wilderness, shown this amazing mountain, shown the presence of God, amazing miracles, and now told that you must do this and you must do that. And this group is separated from that group. And this group is here. And this group is there. And, and all of these different rules. And it took, literally, it took a long time for them to get used to these things. It took a long time for them to, to learn them. You, they didn't, believe me, the first generation did not hold stone, just know it. They had to review it over and over and over and over again. 
you'll notice as you read throughout the scripture that whenever Israel gets in trouble, whenever something bad comes upon them as a nation, if you look into the story at its roots, it always comes down to this fact that at some point they stopped doing what they were told to do. They stopped doing the rules and the regulations and following the laws and the ceremonies. And when they did, God normally gave them a warning. He normally did something to try to get their attention, to wake them up. And he would do that sometimes two or three or four or five times trying to get their attention, warning them that if you continue to do this, bad things were going to come your way. And eventually what would happen is if they stayed on that path, if they stopped doing, if they stopped the morality, if they stopped the ethics, if they stopped what it is that God instructed them to do, eventually the protection of God would be lifted off of them. And as soon as the protection of God was lifted off, as soon as he removed his angels from around Israel, what happens? The enemy comes in like a flood. And we have terrible, terrible things happen to the nation of Israel. The approach is what I want to share with you today. Go back to our text real quick. Verse 19 again. Listen to this. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. I want you to understand that what this is saying applies to you and applies to me. It applies to all believers that now, since Christ has come, it equates the veil that stops everybody and anybody except the high priest from going into that center court. That thing that stopped everybody is now opened up. The master has gone through first with his own blood, but he has opened up a way, according to what this says, for all of us now to have boldness to enter into that most intimate place with God that was not ever opened up before. Follow this. And having a high priest over the house of God, so we still have a high priest. There's still someone there who is taking our prayers and petitions and bringing them forth to the throne of God. That's what's in this, the Holy of Holies, the, the throne of God. So, so it's not like the temple that's on the ground. We're talking about the real temple. That now an access is opened up. You do not any longer have to wait on the outside. You no longer, if you are a woman, have to wait in the court of women. That that's not, you're allowed to get closer than that if you want. You don't have to, if you're a Gentile, wait in the court of Gentiles. You don't have to, if you're Jewish, stand in the court of men. And you don't have to, only if you're a Levite, to actually even be around the actual presence of God. And you do not have to be of the line of Aaron to walk into the almighty presence of God. Now, according to this, it is opened up to all of us. That's an amazing thing. I want you to realize how important this is, how big this is to the Jewish mind. The Jewish person reading this, their jaw drops open in this day because it's saying that you now have the access that only the line of Aaron had, that only one man a year was allowed to have. You now have that access to God. Listen to what it says. Having all of this... Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's telling us now that this door is open, you can have access into it, but there you have to have your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, your bodies washed with pure water. In other words, the morality, the rules, the laws, the 613 laws we knew of of the Old Testament, what this is saying is there, you just can't come any old way. You have to come clean. You have to be prepared to walk into the presence of God. 
there's, there's the cleansing of the conscience, but also the cleansing of your actions that needs to go on on a daily basis that allows you or gives you access to come to the presence of God. If you're with me, say amen. amen. So it's, it's implying, it's not implying, it's saying that, that even though we're not talking about the 613 rules, there, there, it, you cannot just come. You must come through the blood of Christ. There, there is a morality, there is an ethic, there is a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And the right way has been opened up for every one of us. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So we're supposed to encourage everyone else around us to do the right thing live the right thing, say the right thing, so that those around us still have access the way we do. That you, we all together can come into the presence of God. I say all of that. The Bible tells us in the law that God visits upon the third and the fourth generation of those who hate Him. Now, I've read that I can't tell you how many times, and it took me a long time before I fully understood what that meant, because when you read it, it sounds like what it's saying is if somebody does something wrong, then for the next three generations, God is, is judging the next three or four generations. And you look at that and you say, that, that just doesn't sound like something uh, godly. And I'm sure, God's ways are different from our ways, but I don't know, that just, that just I don't know, it, it just rubbed me the wrong way as I understood it that way until I understood that what it was saying is not that if somebody does something wrong, God judges the next generation and the next generation and the next generation up to the third and fourth generation. What he's saying is if there is a generation that does wrong, that compromises, that stops all of the, the laws, that stops doing what they're supposed to do, if, if they allow liberalism, progressiveness, into their lives and they stop doing certain things or start doing certain things that God never intended for his people to do, then what happens is the next generation sees what the previous generation has done and they do worse. They do more. What they see mom and dad do, they'll do, they'll do with, with less conscience. And then the generation that sees that will do more. And, and what it actually means is that God will only allow it to go to the third or fourth generation before he steps in and does something. Does that make sense? And, and we see it throughout, throughout the text so many times, if you, if, you, if you go back and you look at the math, it's normally the fourth generation of a group that gets judged. And it's not that God just poured out judgment. He warned and he warned and he warned and he warned. But if they continued in that way, then finally, ultimately, God would take his protection off. If you understand what I'm saying, say amen. amen. I say that because, beloved, we live in a culture that that seeps into our Christianity so much. We, we have been super saturated by the culture around us that, that, there, that sometimes, not sometimes, very often, we wind up allowing or doing things or compromising in ways. Sometimes we don't even realize we're compromising, but we allow things to come into our lives that the generation after us sees. And then they go further. Now this is both, don't forget he's talking about the people of God when he speaks about this, but this goes for any group of people. Whatever one generation allows, the next generation allows more. And it progresses and it progresses and it progresses. A little leaven, leaven, that's what it means. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It rises, it gets bigger, the further out it goes. That's exactly what this means. And I bring this message to you, not to upset anybody, not to cross anybody, but to share a truth with you, because God has opened up access for all of us to come to that place that no other people were ever allowed. But now we are. But things have crept into our lives 
compromise has crept into our way of doing things that I fear that if we don't stop, what the next generation will do. If we don't pull in the reins now, what the next, and I'm not talking about the next secular generation, the next Christian generation will do and will allow. And I think one of the best ways to show this truth is, is, is with regards to alcohol, to wine. This is just an example, but, but it, it follows through the scripture. There's more than just the issue of wine. It's lots of other things, but follow this just for a moment. Throughout the scripture, God tells his people over and over and over again to stay away from strong drink, to abstain from strong drink, not to allow strong drink in their midst. In our culture today, that's definitely part of our culture. And even within the church, you have different ideas or beliefs with regard to this. And even myself, beloved, I'm, I preached that myself before I ever bring this to you. God convicted my heart of certain things I thought and, 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 and ways that, that, that I've spoken. And after really digging into it, I bring this to you for what God has done with me. Because the next generation sees what you say and sees what you do. And will take it even further than you did. Throughout the text, throughout from, from, from Genesis on, alcohol is never, ever held up as a thing the people of God should be involved in. Ephesians 5, everybody turn there real quick. Here's a New Testament verse, but it's also within our Old Testament. But Ephesians 5, and look with me at verse... I think it's 16. Uh, 15. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So, so it's saying, make sure that what you do is what? Is right. Make sure the way you live is right. So that, you, so that you're uh, as wise, not as a fool. Redeeming the time... Because what? The days are evil. So it's saying make sure you live right. You do what's right. Because the culture around you is what? The days are evil. So you do what's right. Live circumspectly. Live wisely because people are watching. But know that the culture around you is evil. Verse 17. Therefore do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what? What God's desire is for us. Just like the laws of the Old Testament, His desire for Israel, what's His desire for us? And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all the things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now people have read that and say, well, what he means is not to get drunk with wine, but it's okay if you have a little bit of it, but don't get drunk. That's not what it means. Remember, the text is saying, live wisely. Be careful of the culture that's around you. Do what's right. Live circumspectly. And he even chooses this idea. Do not be drunk with wine. And I think a better uh, translation of it is not, not, to be, not that you can drink wine and not be drunk. Don't drink wine or strong drink at all is what he's saying. But instead do what? Be filled with the Spirit. Why do we have, what do we call alcohol? Spirits. Why do people, uh, 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 are, why are people attracted to, to uh, mind-altering substances, to mood-altering substances, whether they are drugs, whether they are alcohol? Why? Be because it changes your condition for a short period of time. It gets your mind off of what's going on around you. 
People are looking for, wanting something, and, and when they don't find it, we look for it in anything else that will get us out of our situation, at least momentarily. And that becomes the root of, of, of all addictions, all addictions. And what this is saying is, is if you have Jesus, that should be enough. He is, and I don't mean this in the wrong way, but understand what I'm saying, he is the drug you're craving. He is the escape you're craving. He is the mood-altering thing that everybody looks for. And look at what it says. Uh, make melody in your hearts, sing spiritual songs. He's talk what do people do when they drink alcohol? They start drinking and singing. You know, they, they start acting silly and singing songs. And what it's saying is, instead of doing that through this substance, in the Lord, find your joy. Now, I want, again, there's, throughout the church, there's a lot of different views on this. There are, are, are many who say, well, you can drink and you can do it socially. And other, Beloved, I think the scripture, I know the scripture says, stay away. Don't do it. Why? Why? Confusion has come because of verses like this. 1 Timothy 5, 23. The Apostle Paul says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. He says it to Timothy, one of his students, that to, to take a little wine. Here's what, what and, and for everybody that looks at that and says, oh, you see, God said, you know, it says in the scripture, you can drink a little wine, has no idea what wine means in the Bible. There is a difference between wine and what we today in our culture call wine. In, in the Hebrew, there's two different words for it. One means strong drink. The other means grape juice. Fruit of the vine. In the Greek, the word for both strong drink and grape juice are the same. It's wine. But in this day, in this culture, alcoholic beverages were not put together using grapes. It was put together using palm plants. Palm wine, not grape wine. When you hear the New Testament or you hear the Old Testament, the use of strong drink, yes, it means alcohol. But when you hear the word wine, it means fruit, grapes. And literally what they did in this culture was, was when the grape harvest came in, you needed that harvest to last throughout the year. They would take the grapes and literally make what we today would call jelly a grape jelly. And that grape jelly would, could be stored for an entire year until the next harvest. And what you would do is you would take a wine skin, an animal skin, and you would fill it with water. And then when you wanted to drink, you would take a teaspoon or, a, or a, a, a certain measurement of the actual jelly and put it in the water. And depending upon how strong or sweet you wanted the drink is how much of the jam you put in there. And so what they were drinking was not alcohol by any means. Over time, inside of a wineskin, bacteria starts to grow. And if you left your wine, your grape drink, in the wineskin long enough, the fermentation process would start. But that's why they would add water to even what was in the wineskin. On Passover, when Passover was celebrated, the, the drink that was had had anywhere from four to ten parts water to one part grape. We're talking about the grape juice we drink is stronger for communion than what they drank at the Lord's Supper. The reason why Jesus says you do not put new wine in an old wineskin, nobody would do it because the old wineskins have bacteria growing in them. And when you put the new wine into the old wineskin, what began, began to happen? Fermentation. And it would grow alcohol. So you, the, it says you do not put new wine into an old wineskin so that there's no fermentation. Beloved, and, and I can go on... 
example after example after example that what they drank was not anywhere related to or close to what we call wine today. And even what Timothy is told to do is not wine as we know it. It is strong grape juice. Were there people that drank wine? Yes, palm wine. Were there people that got drunk? Yes. But God's command was, don't drink it. Stay away from it. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. To have fermentation, you need yeast. The yeast eats the sugar. The byproduct of the yeast eating the sugar is alcohol. You cannot have yeast at Passover, can you? You go throughout the house and you make sure that all the leaven is gone because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You do that not just for the bread, but also the wine itself. If it has fermentation, what's inside of it? Leaven. So if the wine is his blood and the bread is his body in which there is no sin, all the leaven is out of the bread and all the leaven is out of the cup as well. So it's a very different thing than most people think when you say wine. And there's a lot more to it, but, but even as you go throughout the scripture and you look at all the instances of alcohol, none of them are ever good. In Genesis chapter, I think I went ahead. In Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 through, through 26, it's the story of Noah getting off the ark, and one of the first things he does, bad example, but he makes wine. What kind of wine? Strong drink wine. He gets drunk, and his son, who must have also gotten drunk, comes in and looks upon his nakedness. We're talking about homosexuality here. And Canaan is cursed his entire line. Why? Because they got drunk. That's what led to that entire incident. Uh, Genesis chapter 19, verses 31 through 38. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. A lot and his two daughters are the only ones who survive. Jewish tradition states that their, their belief was they were, that all of the world had been destroyed, that there was nobody left. They were the only ones, and they were up in the mountains, in the caves, and it tells us that the two daughters, thinking they're the last people on earth, got their father drunk and committed incest with him and had children. What did alcohol lead to? Incest. Exodus chapter 32, verses 25 through 35, Moses comes down the mountain, and instead of worshiping God, they have built themselves a golden calf. Read closely, it says that they drank wine, took off their clothes, and got into what the Bible calls revelry. Do you know what revelry is? I don't have to explain that, do I? What started this? The wine. Brought down their inhibitions, and they started... Revelry. I'll leave it at that. And we can go on and on and on. David uh, commits murder, killing Uriah. What does he try to do with Uriah to cover it up? Get him drunk so you go sleep with your wife and she thinks the baby's yours. And every time, I can go through, through experience after experience and story after story, strong drink never turns out good. It always has some, and, and yet... The, the, the examples are the same. It's drunk, the inhibitions go down, the clothes come off, and revelry gets on, I guess. Every single time. From example to example to example. That's why God told the Levites and the Israelites, no strong drink. Stay away from it. Did, were there people of the Old Testament who were Levites and priests and Jews that drank? Yes. Were they wrong? Yes. And each time they did, there's a horrible example to go with it. Daniel chapter 1, it tells us. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach are brought to, uh, to Babylon. And they are unwilling to eat the king's food. They're going to be raised up in Babylon. These are young men. They're probably about 11, 12 years old at the most. 
But these men had been raised to be Levites. They were priests. They were the princes of Israel. So that for the first 12 years of their life, they had learned the law. They learned what God's word was. They were eventually going to be the people in the temple. But they were captured by Nebuchadnezzar, brought to Babylon, and now Nebuchadnezzar wants to use them to raise them up to be the, 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 the strong minds of Babylon. And look at what a little 12-year-old boy says to the king of Babylon. But Daniel purposed in his heart, and not just Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as well, purposed in their heart that they would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Here's a little boy who has been taught since he could understand that a, a, a Hebrew does not defile themselves with strong drink. And here in front of the king is, is standing his ground. No compromise. He, it would have been easy for him. He's so far away from his teachers, so far away from Israel. There is no more Israel. Temple's gone. Everything that he knew is gone. And yet he held on to his faith. Yet he stood when the culture around him thought differently. No compromise. Even when everybody else was compromising. Listen, in our culture, social drinking. You'll notice every time there's a commercial for social drinking, it's young people. It's young people and they look like they're having the time of their lives. And they've got the beautiful car and the beautiful house and, and, and everything seems to be going great. Always young people. And, and even in our culture today, it, it goes past the idea of just young people, even, even business. In order to network, in order to do business, you got to go to the bar. You got to sit down. You got to have a drink. You got to be sociable. We've got to be careful. Because what one generation allows, the next generation takes further. What one generation compromises on becomes a bondage for the next generation and the next generation. And sooner or later, God's protection comes off. I'm talking about the people of God. The world is the world. The people of God. Why no strong drink? Why no compromise? Because you have been invited into the holy place. You, like the priest of old, like Daniel, who stood his ground even when, every, even when he was away from, even when he was on vacation in the Caribbean. He got the little drink with the straw in it, but he made sure it was a virgin pina colada. Because he would not defile himself from his God. And it's not just a New Testament idea, it is, excuse me, an Old Testament idea, it is a New Testament idea. Why, why does the next culture take it that much further? It's what we call progressivism, liberalism. Uh, it, it just, it is, it is human nature. We take it to the next level. Think about this. This has nothing to do with alcohol, but think about this. Remember, as a kid, Getting, as a, at least a, a young boy, getting your six shooters, and you thought you were a cowboy. I, I can't tell you how many of those I had. And we'd run out into the woods and we'd play army and put caps in them and shoot at each other. And we thought it was just the coolest thing. And the next generation of these gum, guns came into being, and it went from the western six shooters to now the Glock and the M4 or M16 or whatever it is. And now those things are illegal. They don't, they, you're, it, you're very difficult to try to even find these things made anymore because of what is the normal progression of people. But what has happened 
is we've gone from plastic toy guns and running outside and playing in the woods to video games where they are first person shooter games where you stand behind the rifle and you see it moved and aimed and up and down and you watch the bullets hit the person and the graphics have become so good that you actually see the pink smoke as you hit them. And a suit is worn for some sort of protection, some sort of uh, anti-ballistic wear, some sort of helmet, some sort of Kevlar. And there are young men and young women who spend hours and hours and hours and hours behind that little game, shooting people, killing people, killing zombies, killing things in a first person, in their mind, hand on the trigger. And while there are some people who can separate reality from fiction, the fact of the matter is the next generation takes it further. And that's why we get things like Columbine. That's why we get things like Aurora in the movie theater. That's why we get things like the, the Sikh temple killings. That's why we get things like Connecticut. Look at what all of those groups have in common, and I guarantee you each one of those men spent hours and hours and hours behind a game watching people die. And you think of the description of what they wore when they went to go do what they did. They looked like that. And in their mind, you can't help but realize that to them, it was a game. To shoot people became a game. This is obviously the most tragic example of it, but beloved, the truth is this. What one generation allows, the next generation takes further, and the next generation takes further. And it's true, whether it's this, whether it's drinking, whether it is the, uh, our definition of marriage, Live wisely, be circumspect, because the days are evil. And alcohol is just one example of this. What we do affects the next generation. Our liberalism is multiplied in the next generation. If, if in our minds we have, and, and listen, God has to do the convicting of this. No man can. But if you can sit and, and drink wine or drink beer um, and, and, and your kids see it, it may not be a big deal to you. And it may wind up never to be a big deal. But for most people, the adults who do that, you look at the next generation, they do that and more. The next generation will be the binge drinker will be the one at college passing out. will be the one bar hopping from place to place. And what we don't realize is they, they saw us. They watched us. And they took it to the next level. And if their children see them, God forbid what the third and fourth generation will do. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Jesus is enough. He really is. In the Old Testament, I'm going to end with this. Out of all the people who surrounded the temple, from the women to the men to the children to the Levites to the priest that was inside the Holy of Holies, throughout all of them was a mixture of three groups. Prophet, priest, king. Anybody in Israel could have been tagged to be a prophet. There were male prophets and female prophets of no particular lineage. There were the kings, all of the lineage of David, and then the northern kings, not of the lineage of David. 
And then there were the priests. They all had a function. Why would God, in establishing a people on this planet, to be his example that later on when he sends his son for all of the planet, we should look at that group of people as our example? Why give us the Old Testament? Why give us the Tanakh and, and have it as an example unless it really means something to us? Because in that day, the three offices were separated, prophet, priest, and king. And they all stood in a different place in relationship to the approach of the temple. The prophet was the mouthpiece of God. When they spoke, they said, Thus saith the Lord. When they spoke, it was the oracles of God coming forward. When they spoke, people listened because they wanted to hear what was the will of God in this situation. What is the direction we should take? They were the mouthpiece of God to the nation. So God had a, a separate group of people just for that. Then there were the, the priests. The priest's job were to be the physical representation of God to the people. When the people came to temple and they saw the priest, they saw holy men. When they came to the temple, they saw men who lived a certain way. And, and the difference in morality, the closer you got to the temple, was more and more strict. What the priest, what, what, the, what the prophets could do on the outside, what the rest of the Jews or the Hebrews could do on the outside was not the same as what the Levites did on the inside. And the priest became the physical representation. When people saw them, it reminded them of their God. They were the physical representation of Jehovah. And then there was the king, who was the moral authority of the land. He said what was right and what was wrong. You went to him for judgment. You had a problem. You listened to his wisdom and he told you what was right or what was wrong. He was the morality of the day. A prophet, priest, and king. Beloved, today, not only has Christ opened up the veil and allowed each one of us to have entry into the holy place, to have a place of intimacy with God, no other people have ever had. But the closer you want to get to the Lord, the more stringent our actions become the more washed you need to be. And while there was a morality for all of the Jews, the closer you got, the heavier it got. How close do you want to get? How close do you want to get? You see, because there's people within the kingdom of God that are just fine being in the court of the Gentiles. Just fine with being right on the outskirts where nobody notices me where there's not much difference between them and the world on the outside. What should be all of our desire, once you hear it's available, is, man, I want to get to the place where God is. I want to get close. The Scripture tells us, if you draw near to Him, He draws near to you. Look at Daniel. Look at the, the revelation Daniel was given. Why? Because as a 12-year-old boy, he stood up and he said, I'm not going to do this. I will not compromise. I know what is right and wrong. And look at what God gave that young man throughout all of his life. I want that. I want to be in the presence of God. Today, you are prophet, priest, and king. You are the voice of God when you walk out of these doors. People listen when you take this and you bring it out in your life. You affect people all around us. You are the moral authority when we do what this says, when we can share with people this is right and this is wrong because God's Word says this. This is morality, this is immorality, this is clean, this is unclean. You become a king. And you become the physical manifestation of God to people. You may be the only Jesus people get to see. You are an ambassador for Christ. Amen. You are prophet, priest, and king. Be careful what you allow into your life. Because not just your children, 
everyone else around you is watching. And they will base what they do on what you do. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, I, I, I did that or I went there because I saw that pastor so-and-so did it. Or I saw that, that brother so-and-so had that particular movie channel or this or that or the other thing. And you realize people are watching. And we affect everyone around us. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Draw near. Draw near. Amen. That is your inheritance. I don't think most of us even understand fully what that means. What God is willing to do if we would draw near. And that's God's word for you for this morning. Let us see you as the angels see. Let us see you as the elders see. Let us see you as all heaven sees. We will bow.